Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. The portfolio this afternoon is social justice, housing and local government. Um, as ever, I'd ask anybody who wishes to ask a supplementary question to press the request speak buttons or place an RTS in the chat function if they're joining us online during the relevant question. Um, the usual plea, um, given the demand um, for supplementaries today, uh, for brief questions and brief answers as far as possible. And I call question number one, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer, and my sincere apologies again that I have to leave after my question for, for personal reasons. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the expenditure in West Scotland from the Tenant Grant Fund, including whether funding has been renewed as a result of its programme for government announcement to widen eligibility. Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Tenant Grant Fund spend data to the end of January 2022, broken down by local authority, was published in March 2022. Since then, all local authorities have been asked to provide up-to-date reports covering uh, the financial year 21-22, quarter four, as well as for the first two quarters of this year. Uh, this information is being collated and quality assured, and it will be published by the end of this year. Uh, as per the programme for government, the local authorities will be able to use any unspent funds to support people who have built up more recent arrears, and guidance will be issued to local authorities shortly. Neil Bibby. I thank the Minister for that answer. Scottish Labour welcomes the fact that the Government widened eligibility for the fund in the programme for Government. Once again, it is something we called for in our cost of living plan in August that the Government adopted. However, the Government has not published its updated guidance on the widening of the scheme and, more critically, the renewal of the £10 million has not been provided. Given three of the six councils wholly in the West Scotland region have exhausted the original funding and the other three have just 35000 between them, this empty gesture will do nothing to help tenants struggling with arrears through the cost of living crisis. Will the Minister therefore renew the funding and ensure the grant fund is fit for purpose? Minister. Well, I, uh, I welcome uh, Neil Bibby's uh, support for this move, even if it's uh, a little bit short-lived, because he, he seems to have uh, not welcomed it by the end of his question. Uh, this fund was set up to support tenants during COVID, uh, and uh, it was announced that we would uh, extend that eligibility in the way that Mr Bebby has explained. Local authorities do have to consider outstanding applications in relation to arrears accrued during the COVID pandemic uh, before then considering uh, applications in relation to more recent arrears. And that will be made clear in updated communications uh, to local authorities and, the, and in the guidance. But I don't think any of us have to look far to find areas of the Scottish budget where we would all like to put more money. And I very much hope that Labour colleagues will join us in calling on the UK Government to inflation-proof the Scottish budget to enable us to do that. Yeah. Supplementary, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank the, the uh, Minister for that answer. Will the Minister outline how the Scottish Government intend to make the, the private rented sector uh, remain affordable and sustainable over this winter period? Minister. Well, indeed, we have uh, uh, asked uh, local authorities to ensure that um, the private rented sector is able to benefit from uh, the Tenant Grant Fund, as well as from the other support that we make available. And it's the information and data that's currently being collected by local authorities and which will be collated and published later this year that will show us whether that, uh, that emphasis has had the desired impact. Uh, I hope that we can all recognise that the Scottish Government is putting substantial funding into supporting tenants uh, in all parts of the rented sector uh, throughout these difficult times. Question two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact inflation is having on its affordable housing programme. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are aware of the global issues affecting construction, including the war in Ukraine and rising inflation, which has been exacerbated by Brexit and the current cost crisis. We are working closely with the construction industry and housing partners to mitigate this where possible to achieve our shared goal of delivering more affordable homes for Scotland, including operating a flexible grant system which can take account of increased costs. I am heartened that the affordable housing sector continues to show signs of recovery, with completions having risen by 17 per cent compared to the previous year to June 2021. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Does she agree that new affordable home construction has been undermined by the UK Tory government cutting Scotland's capital grant this year from 4,973 to less than 4,469 million, a fall of more than 10 per cent, £504.1 million? 
and that unless they reverse this double whammy of cuts to our capital grant, coupled with rising inflation due to Tory economic incompetence, will further reduce new build, and that next week's UK budget will be a good place to start reversing these cuts. Cabinet mm. Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, inflation and the uh, economic chaos caused by the UK Government means our annual budget today is worth £1.7 billion less than last December. We are facing an enormous strain at the same time as focusing on protecting people from the cost of living crisis and mitigating against many of the UK Government's cuts, particularly those impacting uh, people on low incomes and child poverty. So instead of cutting Scotland's capital grant, we've urged the UK Government to release additional public spending on infrastructure and consider other measures to help ease these pressures and allow our capital programme to continue at the required uh, pace. And I would agree with Kenny Gibson that the uh, UK budget would be a good place to start. And two brief supplementaries. Thank, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, housing associations across Scotland are reporting that the Scottish Government's rent control scheme is resulting in their chaos to have to rewrite their plans and economic plans for new construction. So can I ask, how many fewer homes does the Cabinet Secretary think this will now deliver? Cabinet Secretary. So the big impact on the social rented sector and local authorities at the moment are the issue of uh, high interest rates, which affects their loans, and of course rampant inflation, which has been exacerbated by the actions of the UK Tory government. In terms of the rent freeze, uh, as the member knows well, we are working closely with the sector uh, to establish uh, the key considerations for any cap on rents beyond the 31st of March uh, next year because there have been no impact in terms of rents in the social sector this year because they were already set. So what we're talking about is from the 1st of April uh, next year. And we've said we'll provide certainty by the 14th of January at the very latest. Uh, what I would say in the meantime, we operate a flexible grant system uh, which we expect will allow the continued delivery of affordable uh, homes. And, of course, uh, we are working very closely uh, with the sector to help them address some of the challenges. But as I said in my answer to Kenny Gibson, completions have risen by 17 per cent compared to the previous year, uh, to June 2021. So we are still seeing projects coming in, and I would encourage uh, RSLs to continue to submit those. And Willie Rennie. Uh, I'm keen to understand where mid-market rents sit, whether the sit within the affordable sector or the private sector with regards to the rent cap legislation. Because I'm keen for more mid-market rented properties to be built, but they need certainty for that to happen. So where do they sit? Cabinet Secretary. So uh, I will write to Willie Rennie with further detail, but in essence, they can, uh, some uh, mid-market rent uh, sits within the private residential, the residential sector and built by uh, the private sector, and some sits within the social rented sector that are uh, built by RSL. So it would really depend on where they sit, but I'm happy to write uh, to the member with more details of that, if he would find that helpful. Thank you. Question number three, Siobhan Bray. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local authorities to deliver relief for residents at risk of poverty during the cost of living crisis and in light of rising energy costs. Mr Ben McPherson. Presiding Officer, we are working with local authority partners to support people facing the cost of living crisis. Uh, through the emergency budget review, we have taken a number of actions, including allocating almost £20 million of additional funding to double the December Scottish Child bridging payment to £260, benefiting around 145,000 el eligible children. We are also making up to £86.6 million available for discretionary housing payments, mitigating the UK Government's unfair bedroom tax and benefit cap, and giving local authorities more flexibility to support people with energy bills. And of course, we all are also providing uh, over £260 million to support council employee pay rises, uh, especially benefiting uh, lower paid workers. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Minister for the answer. In July this year, concerned with the looming energy crisis, I met with local churches to discuss the idea of warm, welcome spaces for the winter. And I'm glad to see now it's being rolled out throughout churches in Air, Presswick and Troon. I note during these difficult times, local authorities are putting measures in place to assist local communities. And SNP-run North Ayrshire Council have launched a massive £450,000 fund to help out residents through the cost of living crisis. Does the Minister agree with me that all councils across Scotland should take similar steps? Minister. Uh, I know that uh, all councils um, are considering these matters and many local authorities are, are working to help people with the, the cost of living crisis uh, using 
their own resources and, and powers. And th that includes uh, exploring the establishment of warm spaces uh, and the fund that uh, North Ayrshire Council uh, has set up. I'm also aware, if I call recall correctly that uh, Glasgow City Council uh, has created a £3 million fund, including £1 million for fuel top-up cards. Midlothian Council has put £29,000 into a heat and eat fund for uh, families to help them uh, who, uh, when they are not eligible for Scottish welfare fund support. Uh, and Falkirk Council has allocated over uh, half a million pounds for their household support fund, providing uh, cash first support to 1,000 households since September 2022. So there are a number of actions taking place. And I think this symbolises how we all need to work together in this cost of living crisis to support people. A couple of supplementaries. First, Jeremy Ball. Thank you, Deputy President. The Minister will be aware one of the best ways to help people is to get the appropriate Social Security benefits. But Social Security Scotland announced yesterday that for four days next week they will be taking no online applications and people will not be able to apply for benefits during that period. Is this acceptable and, does, and what measures will he take to make sure that my constituents and his constituents are adversely affected by this? Minister. Well, of course, uh, Social Security Scotland is providing more benefits to people in Scotland than are available elsewhere in the UK. And the reason that uh, Social Security Scotland is having to pause applications electronically through its systems through the period of time that Mr Balfour has stipulated is because there are system upgrades and um, processes that need to, to run through in order to deliver the really significant intervention on Monday the 14th yeah. of November of our Scottish child payment yeah. only available in Scotland yeah. going up to £25 yeah. per week per child yeah. for eligible children and being extended yeah. to children who are eligible who are under 16 and uh, taking the possible um, take up of that benefit from around 100,000 children to an eligibility uh, figure uh, if people apply of 400,000 children. So, you know, yeah. we're focused on running really good systems and doing things correctly, uh, and that involves making sure that the, the IT systems and the operational systems in Social Security Scotland are, are all running the way they need to be for Monday the 14th of November, and we'll help all the people that we will. Pam Duncan Glancy, briefly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Public Services Ombudsman report found that there was a 36.7% increase in the Scottish Welfare Fund review applications received from the previous year. Can the Minister set out when he will be able to tell us about the, the review of the Scottish Welfare Fund and when it will be complete? As briefly as possible, Minister. I, I thank Pam Duncan Duncan Glancy and other members for their interest in this important area and, and the Scottish Welfare Fund is an important aspect of how we help people every year and especially this year and um, I will be updating the committee very shortly on uh, that review and look forward to doing that. Thank you. Question number four, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government for its response to the latest Registers of Scotland UK House Price Index figures. Cabinet Secretary. Housing to 2040, our long-term housing strategy, is designed to be agile and we assess programmes and make adjustments as needed. So recognising wider market conditions, in August we increased the thresholds for our open market shared equity scheme by an average of 9% to support more first-time buyers and priority groups into home ownership. We also operate a flexible grant system which can take account of increased cost to partners when purchasing properties on the open market for affordable use. The economic chaos of recent months caused by the UK Government has, of course, not helped. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. The latest report showed an annual increase of nearly 28 per cent for house prices in the Western Isles. This is part of a trend that has seen local house prices rise by more than 81 per cent since 2015, higher than any other local authority area. Meanwhile, we have areas like Harris, where something like a fifth of the housing stock is tied up in second homes and short-term lets. Is the Cabinet Secretary willing to meet with me and partners like Corn and Yenyel and Shear to discuss possible solutions to this serious problem? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course, I'm always uh, open to discussing uh, housing issues raised by members and councils, and I'm happy uh, to arrange this. It's uh, worth noting uh, that £43.3 million pounds is being made, av made available in this Parliament through the Affordable Housing Programme uh, in the Western Isles, and I would expect the Council to be working closely with relevant partners to ensure delivery of the affordable housing that local communities need. Uh, my officials are working closely with the Council to achieve this and are meeting in the islands uh, next week as well as progressing the development of a remote rural and island action, housing action plan uh, to support housing delivery in rural Scotland. But we'll get that meeting established as soon as we can. Question number five, Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Advisory Officer. Can I refer to my register of interests? 
uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent Highlands and Islands Enterprise Survey, in which 76% of people who responded said that there aren't enough affordable houses for rent or to buy locally. Cabinet Secretary. So while we uh, delivered uh, 3,417 affordable homes over the last uh, Parliament in the Highlands and Islands, we recognise that challenges remain. I'm pleased that we're making available more than uh, £422 million to support the delivery of affordable homes in the region during the current Parliament. In recognition of the challenges facing our more uh, remote communities, we're working with stakeholders to develop a remote rural and island housing action plan, which will be published in the spring. Donald Cameron. It's clear that the lack of affordable housing is one of the main drivers of depopulation of the Highlands and Islands, and there are now over 9,000 households on the waiting list for social homes in the Highland Council area alone. Given that the Scottish Government has continually failed to meet its building targets for affordable homes, what action will the Cabinet Secretary now take to help people in the Highlands and Islands get a home. Cabinet Secretary. So a couple of things. Um, we have made available to Highland Council a 25% increase on the funding provided over the last parliamentary term, uh, over £240 million. Uh, and we've also, of course, got the Rural and Island Housing Fund. Uh, we've also uh, delivered more than uh, uh, six, uh, sorry, 1,600 uh, more uh, homes in uh, rural, uh, uh, remote um, Scotland uh, that this, this Parliament. Uh, so there is an increase in the number of homes being delivered in uh, remote and rural Scotland. Um, but I do think that Donald Cameron and his colleagues on the Tory benches need to be consistent because he mentioned uh, the issue of uh, affordable houses for rent or to buy locally. And one of the issues that he will be aware of, of course, is the loss of homes to holiday lets and short term lets. So when we brought forward legislation to address that and to avoid the loss of homes within his area and other uh, members' areas to short-term lets and holiday lets in order to address some of the issues that he raises in this parliament. How many his colleagues voted against that legislation? So what we need to see from Donald Cameron and others is a bit of consistency because when we uh, develop and deliver the levers to help address some of these problems, I just don't understand why him and his colleagues come along here and vote against those levers. There's no consistency in their position whatsoever. We also need slightly shorter answers. Brief supplementary, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Notwithstanding the cost issues that Kenny Gibson's outlined, can the Cabinet Secretary comment on the progress of the affordable housing supply programme that's been, um, been undertaken to make sure that the target of 10% of the uh, 110,000 affordable housing uh, targets met? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, Gillian Martin raises a, a really important issue here. Um, the 110,000 uh, target has been uh, really important and it builds, of course, on the 113,000 affordable homes delivered uh, since 2007, with 6, 000, more than 6,000 of those delivered in rural and island communities. But we recognise that there are particular barriers uh, to delivering affordable housing within rural Scotland, which is why the Remote and Rural Housing Action Plan, which is going to be published in the spring, is so important, because it specifically addresses how we can remove those barriers to speed up the process of delivery of affordable homes within uh, rural Scotland. And I'm sure when she sees it, she will recognise the importance of that plan. Question number six, Carol Moore. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Social Justice Cabinet Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues on any potential impact on levels of personal debt of the inclusion of individual consumers under the Movable Transactions Scotland Bill. Minister Tom Arthur. Presiding officer, the bill is a long overdue reform of the law of security relating to movable property, making it a matter for the economy portfolio rather than the social justice portfolio. The main reform in the bill which may impact on individual consumers is the introduction of the statutory pledge. I am in no doubt that it should not be possible to grant a statutory pledge over ordinary household goods. And so its impact on individual consumers is expected to be limited. However, I recently met with Citizens Advice Scotland and other debt advice agencies and listened carefully to what they had to say in this. And I can confirm to the Mayor in Parliament that I am very well disposed to strengthening the consumer protections in the bill. Carol 
Thank you. I do thank you very much for that answer. Um, as you said, the bill is currently constituted would allow people who are in very difficult uh, financial circumstances to borrow money based on the value of their items around the value of £1,000. It seems that, as you have said, almost every consumer debt and money advice organisation has highlighted the serious pitfalls this prevents for those struggling in debt. In short, a bill designed to help businesses is suddenly incentivising irresponsible lenders to target individuals in financial distress. I am glad the cut off the Cabinet Secretary's answer, but can I just clarify that you will um, seek to speak with uh, colleagues in other uh, portfolios to amend the bill accordingly? As briefly as possible, Minister. Yes, I am very happy to engage. I am very happy to engage directly with the member. Uh, my position right now is I am wait, awaiting uh, the report of the DPLR committee. I gave evidence last week to the committee. I want to carefully consider what their recommendations are. But I recognise the concerns that have been raised. I am considering them very carefully. I will consider the report very carefully. And I am happy to meet with any member ahead of the stage one debate to discuss these matters further. Thank you. Question number seven, Miles Briggs. To ask the Scottish Government what actions are being taken to end the practice of children living in temporary accommodation in light of recent homelessness statistics. Cabinet Secretary. So we want everyone to have the stability of a settled home that meets their needs and to ensure that the time spent in temporary accommodation is as short as possible. Our strong homelessness legislation means that homeless households, including those with children, have a right to temporary accommodation, which provides an important safety net. However, I have asked an expert group chaired by Shelter Scotland and the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers for an action plan to help reduce the numbers of people in temporary accommodation with a strong focus on households with children. The group will produce the final recommendations in early 2023. Miles um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Because Shelter Scotland do say our housing system is, in Scotland is broken. In the last year alone, the number of children stuck in temporary accommodation rose by 17 per cent, the highest since records began and a doubling since 2014. Now, the situation in Edinburgh is now beyond crisis levels, with more than a quarter of all children in Scotland living in temporary accommodation here in the capital. We need to see an emergency response, Cabinet Secretary. So can I also ask if she will today agree to purchase personally chair and establish an emergency task force for the capital to specifically look at the issues facing children living in accommodation, temporary accommodation here? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, we already have an expert group chaired by the very Shelter Scotland that he's just mentioned, along with Alacho, that are looking at Edinburgh and the rest of Scotland, and I think we should allow them to get on with uh, that work. Now, in terms of Edinburgh specifically, in the summer I met with uh, the housing uh, convener for Edinburgh and other local authorities under most pressure, and I have recently written to both Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow uh, housing conveners to follow up on these discussions and have reiterated the ask for them to submit proposals which could uh, relieve some of the pressure on temporary accommodation. And I have committed to considering all options that are being brought forward to help with the pressures in temporary accommodation. So they need to come forward, and I've got a, a very much an open door to responding to that. Finally, though, I think Miles Briggs and those on his benches need to recognise that the links from temporary accommodation and people ending up in temporary accommodation are very much linked to poverty and people ending up in debt and in poverty and the cost of living crisis is a major factor in that. So while we will do what we need to do, I would urge him to also make representations to the UK Government to support people at this difficult time. Question 8, uh, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Local Government Minister has had with local authorities regarding, ru regarding running effective consultations on the delivery of frontline public services. Mr Ben McPherson. I regularly speak to representatives of local government on a variety of issues uh, regarding frontline services. Uh, consultations are important to ensure that local people and communities have a meaningful say in decisions on public services. However, councils are independent of the Scottish Government and, as long as they are meeting any con uh, consultation statutory requirements, it is entirely a matter for councils how to carry out consultations, uh, and the Scottish Government has no involvement in those processes. Uh, if there is a particular issue uh, or service Jenny Minto is concerned with, then I am happy to consider that uh, and, uh, as appropriate, uh, ask the relevant Portfolio Minister to respond uh, separately. Jenny Minto. I, I thank the Minister for that very helpful response. Um, as the Minister will know, Argyll and Butte is a hugely diverse area with no two communities the same, and consultations can be on topics as diverse as education change to improving peer infrastructure. 
So when it comes to consulting on local services, one size does not fit all. What guidance would the Scottish Government offer to local authorities to ensure individual consultations get the best responses to reflect the community's needs? As briefly as possible, Minister. I, I agree that the, the diverse and varied needs of, of Scotland's communities is an important aspect to consider when carrying out consultations. This is why I believe councils are best placed to determine uh, the needs for each uh, consultation locally. Uh, the Scottish Government has its own consultation guidance and we seek to ensure that we engage with a, a wide range of stakeholders to take on a broad range of views and experiences to inform policy uh, and decision making. And, uh, I would be happy to have further correspondence uh, with Jenny Minto on, on ways in which uh, the Scottish Government per can perhaps assist her more in her area. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. Can I just add a reminder that those participating in portfolio questions or indeed any debate are expected to stay in for, certainly for portfolio questions, expected to stay in for the duration uh, of portfolio questions, except if they've been given prior uh, consent to leave early. I noticed a couple of members uh, dashed out uh, during the course of proceedings, so I would uh, appreciate that if that did not happen in future. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business. <laughs>